Okay, go for it. Okay. Thank you, James. And uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever one might be, find themselves around the world. Thank you so much for the opportunity this morning to be able to talk to you about some of the research we've been working on. So today I'd like to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing on neural field equations of balanced neural networks. So to start off with, uh, I'd like to just give a brief overview of mean fields and their applications to mathematical neuroscience in the form of neural field equations. So borrowing from such fields like statistical mechanics, mean field equations are a method of capturing the behavior of high dimensional stochastic models by studying a simpler model that approximates the original by averaging over the various degrees of freedom. So in essence, we're reducing the effect of all other individuals of any given individual by approximating a kind of net averaged effect, thus reducing a many body problem to a one body problem. In neuroscience, we use such equations to reduce a coarse grained macroscopic description of the activity of a large ensemble of neurons. One of the earliest and perhaps well well, best well-known uh, such equations are the wilson tarrant equations, where the mean level of activity in a group of neurons is captured by the equation integral differential equations, uh, where x is the location and t is time, and we take the convolution over the other neurons, so we're convoluting over neurons y in order to get kind of this net effect on neuron x. These equations have the great result in their ability to generate phenomena such as traveling waves and localized bumps and have been very successful in kind of doing this. So it has been proposed that the observations such as the, the temporal variability in firing neural network neurons uh, can result from such equations where models uh, or models that approximate balance state between excitatory and, inhib and inhibitory inputs. Characteristics of such models are, are net excitation much greater than the firing threshold balanced by inhibition inputs and require substantial fluctuations above the long time mean to fire. Such a model was first successfully explored by Sempolinsky, Summers, and Christiani in 1996. Next, we can introduce models that have a random structure to them. A prime example of this, perhaps, is the equations introduced by Sempolinsky and Christiani in 1987. Here, the connection strength between neurons are sampled independently from a standard normal distribution of variance one. These are then multiplied by a nonlinear gain function uh, indicated here by lambda, and are typically, which is typically a bounded sigmoidal function. Uh, sigma here is going to represent the magnitude of the white noise, and the J sub JKs are going to be the strength of the network's connections between the various things, between the various neurons, and are not necessarily, in fact, are explicitly not symmetric in this case. This is in contrast for most mean field models where the interactions are not random. The strength scale scales as one over n, and the scale difference from the mean is with high probability much less than one. Such models have therefore been shown to be able to support stable syn synchronized solutions, again, because of the scaling of one over n and the large n limit where we kind of average out and it, you, we can support synchronized uh, solutions. Random networks, however, don't support synchronized solutions as the affected field does not correlate with the mean phase. Because even if the individual neuron were to synchronize, the affected field does not correlate with the mean phase would never really be stable. It's because of the because of the J, the J terms, basically the, the average effect has to permeate through this uh, complicated network. And it's we, in essence, uh, have, it has been shown that, that you can't really get stable, uh, stable synchronization. Uh, in order for us to make this a little more rigorous, we can define an empirical measure as a measure over the stochastic path space. Capital G can be thought of as the net affluent field and is a random centered Gauss probabilistically independent of the white noise with self-consistent covariance. Sempolinsky and Christiani found a self-consistent mean field equation for the limiting dynamics of such, such an empirical measure in the large n limit. In other words, they were able to find a solution a distribution, the law of the system, 
even though uh, at first glance it's a highly self-consistent, uh, somewhat uh, circular kind of uh, system of equations, nevertheless, um, they were able to show that you can indeed define a law for the system. This model, however, is difficult to analyze due to the non-Markovian nature of the equation. In other words, it requires the entire history of the system at each step in order, to, in order to solve the system. This can be gotten around by taking the long-term equilibrium of the system, at which point the covariance is understood to become stationary. However, we, we then lose insight into the short-term phenomena that can be of great interest. So, it was able to be shown, in other words, it was able to be shown that in order to get around this, we take the large M limit. However, the model does become, uh, we do lose quite a bit of information by doing so. So, so as powerful these mean field equations are, they suffer from the following few drawbacks. They are hard to proceed analytically, even on short time scales. It is hard to study the dynamics of the system in kind of a classical sense in order to find uh, fixed points and, and stability of such using kind of more classical uh, dynamical system approaches. And their, their accuracy is not always clear over the long time scales. At the large N and the large T limit is, you, you define well over the large N limit, not necessarily always clear to define them over the large N large T limit. Introducing spatially varying connectivity into the model also makes can make them rather intractable. So this, again, even though these models have been extremely successful, they do unfortunately suffer from some of these um, kind of draw, these kind of drawbacks, and have always been understood to be more of a kind of uh, you know paradigm a set of equations to kind of capture the essence of the dynamics of the system while sacrificing some of the kind of more biological, intuitive, intuitive and tractability of the scaling of the system. So the main contribution uh, that I'm going to be kind of presenting today and the work that we've been working on is a, is a model that consists of autonomous equations, meaning they do not require the entire history of the system, only the current state in order to, to be able to be solved. Uh, these equations represent the large M limit of the random neural, neural network and can be extended to the spatial uh, heterogeneous case. I'll show you kind of, we'll try to show you with both this, the spatially homogeneous and spatially heterogeneous case. And this will allow us to be able to study non-equilibrator phenomena and can be studied using using kind of more classical techniques of dynamical systems. Uh, in essence, we're actually going to be able to reduce our system down to a system of ODE, so it becomes quite, uh, quite manageable. It is worth noting that the, that the first to obtain spatial extended uh, some Belinsky Scrisati uh, equations were Tubal and Caban in 2013, to the, best of, uh, to the best of my knowledge. So we're going to start with the spatially homogeneous case. The first kind of massive key to, to the approach that we're taking is that we define that we can approximate the increment in G not being dependent on X. So a big, again, a big drawback of some of the earlier models was that the um, increment in the net affluent field, capital G, is dependent on X of T, which can be thought of as capturing a lot of, again, the entire history of the system up until that point. Whereas we're gonna take the approximation that, oh, and that can be kind of captured in the first equation I have here, where we see the kind of, kind of the most convolution associated with both, both time steps. Whereas we're gonna take as an approximation, the fact that it is not indeed capital G, the net affluent field is indeed not dependent directly on X of T, a particular time history of a particular firing rate, of, well, associated with a particular neuron. Uh, this assumption, this approximation at first glance may seem a little bit strange, but it actually works fairly reasonable in that the in that capital G, the increment in capital G is, is typically much greater than that with it associated with capital G is, is typically a lot greater than that with associated with X. And we in fact can kind of show that it is 
uh, fairly accurate in, in various different regime, regimes, specifically when lambda uh, is odd. Uh, this approximation allowed us to be able to write the variance of the system. And we take note the fact that since the system is ultimately uh, a center Gaussian of, of mean zero, all of the dynamics involved are indeed captured by the variance. And this allowed us to write the variance of the system as a simple covariance matrix and define it as, as ultimately basically a, sim a simple system of ODEs that can then be solved fairly straightforward and using classical techniques. Um, in fact, we can even uh, straightforwardly um, allow us to get some numerical solutions associated with the, the ODE. So here, what I'm showing you right now are some of the numerics that we've indeed run so thus far on it. And we can indeed see, so we're comparing here the solutions to our ODE to just a stochastic simulation. Now we're only doing it for uh, n equals 1,000 right now, which is fairly kind of low uh, when we're talking about models that really work in the large n limit. But we can see even with such a low n, um, the model seems to be converging quite well um, finding some sort of equilibrium in the system. And in fact, we even uh, did, ran some numerics where we tried uh, some uh, sinusoidal input, which is kind of fairly reasonable uh, assumption, understanding that one, one region of the brain might, might, might introduce a uh, sinusoidal um, input into another region of the brain. And once again, we do see rather a nice convergence of our model into some sort of equilibria of the sinusoidal state of the, our system of o, our, our, our captured system of ODEs with the stochastic simulation in this case. Um, and kind of a big part of what we're doing is that this uh, simple system that I kind of just showed you in the spatially homogeneous case can now be extended to the spatially uh, heterogeneous case. So if we now introduce a new variable associated with the connections, a spatial variable on uh, S1 or on a ring, so we have a theta term that now uh, associates kind of the, <coughs> excuse me, the um, spatially de spatial dependence of the of the uh, of the of the um, variance, uh, which we require to be symmetric for the covariance nature of it. Uh, this is this is very um, kind of has been done and is very similar to work that has been done by Goldman and Lim in 2015 and Darian and Rosenbaum in 2014. I know um, Mr. Rosenbaum is gonna be speaking to me, uh, speaking uh, just after me. Uh, so I hope, I, I hope I'm rep uh, representing things correctly here. So by introducing this kind of spatial uh, dependence into our system, and once again, we're making a, the same kind of assumption as previously, we're going to make the approximation that the expected increment in the field is independent of the x variable. This produces limiting equations similar to what we had previously, except now the covariance depends on the orientation as well. Uh, we obtain from this coupled integral differential equations for the variance. So these are very similar to the ones that we found for the not for the in uh, the in the homogeneous spatial case, except now we have terms, these equations uh, in, uh, include a spatially dependent, uh, spatially dependent terms. And, they, and although they kind of appear somewhat, uh, you know, somewhat uh, complicated at first glance, they're actually quite tractable using um, very standard, again, standard kind of dynamical uh, methods. And in fact, they're kind of reminiscent of, of the wilson Power equations in that ultimately, they are just convolutions over the, over the various variables. We're just con convoluting in order to. Yeah. Uh, as before, we're able to run some sort of um, numeric simulations for it. And I, I hope this is, is a little bit hard to see. I hope the, uh, the screen can be seen fairly reasonably well. So we're going to present the results here for sinusoidal initial conditions. And we're using a 
uh, a row term, the spatially term, which is very consistent with, again, other, others have done in, uh, in the literature, in, in essence, a, a form of a cosine uh, spatial variable. And once again, we can kind of see, even at the low end limit, we're already kind of getting fairly decent um, convergence and stability in our, in, in our, in our model. So, so here I've kind of tried to present at least an outline of kind of our work, which represents a low dimensional autonomous. So not capturing the, you know, not having the dependence of the time delays as found in some of the kind of earlier models, set of ordinary differential equations that are characterizing the variance of the random neural networks. And was hopefully able to kind of, at least our, even our initial um, numerics were able to kind of demonstrate that they are indeed uh, seem to be fairly consistent uh, this far. Uh, we kind of were able to, because the simplicity of, our, of this model, we're able to both um, do work in both a spatially homogeneous, but as well as kind of very easily extended to a spatially heterogeneous case. And once again, the model seems, at least at our initial glance right now, seems to be fairly consistent as of now. Um, obviously, a lot more numerics kind of testing needs to be done. In fact, some of the numerics that are presented you today were produced uh, very recently. So we still kind of uh, hope to do a lot more kind of uh, work with that, including trying to take things up to a kind of a larger end limit here. Uh, also, um, again, because of the nature and the tractability of our equations, we really be able, hope to be able to, sh to study a little bit more rigorously the oscillations that can be arise in these kind of neural, neural networks. Plus we are working uh, on kind of more analytically proving the existence of things like bump attractors in our, in our uh, balanced neural fields. Now, I, I, I know I've, I've probably glossed over quite a bit <laughs> with this so far, so um, I apologize for that. And uh, all, all the details and things will be forthcoming in, in the paper that we hope to have soon. And we're more than happy to kind of forward, forward that to anybody who's kind of interested in that. Okay, I, I would really like to um, thank so much uh, people involved with this. First and foremost, Pedro Villanova from the Stevens Institute. Uh, he was, he's the one who handled all our numerics that I kind of presented to you today, both the, the ODE solutions as well as the stochastic simulation. So his work was kind of absolutely key to what we're doing here. I also uh, can't thank enough my PhD advisor, James, uh, not only for his insight, uh, and guidance in this research, but also first and foremostly his uh, seemingly infinite patience with me as I kind of try to nav navigate this. And like I said, um, I know it was kind of a little brief uh, today with, with this, but I hope uh, if anybody's kind of interested in more of the details, we'll hopefully all be fleshed out in our kind of forthcoming paper. So I, I thank you so much for your time for listening to me today. And if there are any questions, I'd, I'd love, to, uh, love to hear them. Please speak up, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, um, you referred a couple of times to being able to do things with the ODE model using like standard dynamical systems methods. And um, that model sort of flashed by a little fast. So can you give an, a specific example of like something you can show about the ODE model that you ended up with? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, apologize for uh, moving to that. Uh, rather quickly through it. Um, so the ODE model uh, reduces again to kind of like just a system of ODEs. In fact, uh, apologize, I should probably have a little bit more explicit, uh, a slide with a little bit more explicit form of them here. They're in essence look uh, very similar to the ones, the uh, spatially inhomogeneous ones here where we just get the system of kind of integral differential equations. Of course, in this case, we have these, I'm showing you with the spatial variable, here, but even in the simpler uh, spatially homogeneous space, we you know that's all simplified further, uh, and we could again so we can kind of analyze the system of ODEs in you know again fairly elementary even dynamical system kind of approaches. We can try to uh, well we're 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 in the middle of, of trying to analyze them for you know their analytically find equilibria and we're looking for phase transitions and things like that. Uh, amongst the system of ODEs. I, I don't so know if that answered. 
So an example would be just simply looking at for the equilibrium points and checking their stability, but then you don't specify L and K, so. Yeah, sorry, okay. yeah, I, I, I didn't do that here within here within uh, the slides. Um, I guess I hate, I hate to keep referencing, but in the in the in the forthcoming paper, all of that is kind of a little bit more fleshed out because they're they are the self um, self consistent with the with the um, covariance terms. So there are self consistent uh, integrals uh, with our distribution and the variance terms. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I, thanks for the uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I think my question is is maybe a little similar to John's. Um, I'm wondering how the um, how the single unit dynamics show up in your resulting ODEs for the covariance. Like, are these um, you kind of at the beginning mentioned that that this might be extensible to other other kinds of models? So how does that um, or how would that play out? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you can you um, repeat the question? Yeah, I, um, sure. I'm I, I'm wondering how the single unit dynamics, right, where it, which for this rate network are just the the leak term, how those show up in these ODEs are those, um, and and how modifications to those single unit dynamics would change the ODEs for the covariance. Right. So, so the covariance or the covariance of the the you know the, the large n average. So, so these are still mean field equations, right? Random uh, balanced uh, mean field equations. So these. So we're, we're since since it's ultimately uh, we can show a little more rigorously that the ultimate dynamics of the system are a centered Gaussian. So kind of all the um, dynamics are captured in the variance here and that we are kind of showing, uh, well, these ODs kind of capture the dynamics of the variance of the, these net affluent, these net afferent uh, kind of regions for the, um, for, for the system. I, I don't know if I'm making myself more clear. Yeah, maybe we can talk more um, offline about it. Okay, great. Look forward. Yeah, we have one minute. So just very quickly, um, the the variance is because it's linear. The the variance will decompose into the sum of two variances. So one is the this is the variance of the uncoupled system, and one is the variance of the coupled system. So yeah, the like the tau the leak parameter will pop up in the second variance for the uncoupled system. So it's it's basically linear, but but they they couple in turn via the gain function. So I don't think there's a simple answer about how the tau will shape the dynamics it depends on the other parameters as well okay well thanks again Moshe that was great um appreciate that